drawing is so essential to everything you do. When you combine pencil with watercolor, it's not mixed media. That's, that's the thing to combine. But I also have a great love for this instrument, the pen. But you don't want to use just any pen. It's got to be pens that are archival. So almost all your German-made inks, like the Stadler Lumicolor, those are archival. Archival meaning it's going to be here for a long time. And the Micron, which is a Pigma product, and the, these come from Japan. Sakura, Micron, Pigma, these are great pens. And I just found out that the Micron also comes in a very lovely sepia tone. I ordered it, I don't have it yet, but um, this is a sepia tone drawing you're looking at right here. This goes all the way back to 1995 on a trip to China. And I drew this in when we were at the Great Wall. And it, it's just so fun. It just does everything I love. It zigs and zags. And then I just can pull out little interesting shapes just to kind of fill in. This is a drawing I did recently in southwestern France. And again, you can see the sepia tone color. I love it. I haven't even had a chance to paint this one. But I love it. All these houses going up there in two-point perspective, I might say. See all the corners? I'm doing a lesson on drawing two-point perspective, too. And I'm looking forward to painting this because they'll, they're all going to be reflecting down here. Not all of them, but at least that many. This drawing here comes from South Africa. We were sitting at this lovely restaurant looking out at this view, and there were these roots and rocks from this tree, and it was just so much fun. To draw, I can't. I just can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. So drawing is a pleasure, but it's also essential. So I'm going to help you with your drawing skills, and this time I'm going to focus on drawing this old abandoned building that happened to be at a recent trip when I was in Spain. Just took a walk around the grounds, and as I looked up the hill, I saw this wonderful old building. What I did is I actually walked up the hill right where the building was, and it was incredible. Once I got up there and got a little bit different vantage point over the hill, <laughs> look at what, it was enclosed by all these trees. I absolutely love this. Now I generally, when I do this, there's also some editing involved. I certainly didn't want to put in the old telephone pole or this other building, and I didn't want all of those trees. So I'm just going to talk a little bit as I'm working here. So when I start a subject like this, one of the things I like to do is to simply go for the biggest shapes first. And so that would mean I'm going to have to pull your eye down here and I'm going to have, I, in fact I usually have to put my finger in this case on, the, on a photograph, but it's really nice to be right there and do it. And as I'm drawing, sometimes I look for some of these dark shapes, and I'll just go ahead and put them in right, right then and there. It's, that's half the fun. And then once I've got the basic shapes, bringing your eye through the roof line, coming down over here, forming some of these back shapes. And again, I almost never draw a straight line. I, I like to stop, put in a brick, put in some dark shapes, and whatever it takes to, to make it work. And then I never do a straight line at the bottom of a building, especially an old building like this. So I look for things like the grassy shapes that are going to zig and zag through here. So I try so hard to avoid those hard, straight lines. And then back here we've got some more foliage. And I think it's really fun to put in foliage as just simple shapes. First of all, you've got your branches. The branches keep expanding. So you try to get in some of those to get, create a shape for the tree. And I like to have the tree a little, not like a little lollipop. What can I do to make that tree just a little bit more interesting? So one of the things I can do is leave some openings and avoid a perfectly round tree. 
Now a lot of people come in and they draw the outside shape of the tree. I actually draw what the structure of the tree. And then I might put in some of the leaf-like parts to it. And, but I just like to suggest that. I don't want to go too far. And then over here where it comes around the building, I'm just going to suggest it as some dark shapes. Now we've got this roof line going across here. And one of the things I find is as my pen starts to get dried out a little bit, I like to save some of those pens that are slightly draw, drying out for my first lines to give me the confidence. Because you notice I don't have any pencil lines on this one. I decided to just go for it with the pen. Why not? So now we've got a whole pile of bricks over here. I'll put just a suggestion of those bricks for now. And then something is crossing over here. I love the way it's dipping down. Back up again. And then we have what looks to be like a little window here. Love it. It's exactly what we need in a focal area. So let's make, let's do a big deal, a lot of attention. Let's put some boards outside the window, frame it in. Let's come up here and just give a few little gray areas. Now one of the things I love about this pen is that you can turn it on its side like this and get a slightly lighter tonal wash. A little trick I learned from my friend Bonnie Breitzman. She's a gal you're going to meet in one of my many tutorials. And she probably will show up on quite a few of my capers, too, because Bonnie and I do a lot of travel together. She's a wonderful artist, wonderful gal, wonderful teacher. So you're going to have an opportunity to meet her down the road. But she came up with this idea that you can actually take this pen, turn it on its side like this, and create these gray tones. I love it. So it's, it becomes an important part of what I do. Like, see, this whole area over here is going to be kind of dark. So why not just turn my pen, come in, and get some of those nice grays going. And over here, we have this big doorway. I'm going to go back to the regular pen. I try to avoid any straight lines. I always stop, start, zig and zag it a bit. Have some shapes that are breaking it up. Never, never avoid those really, really dark shapes. And this is such a big shape. It's just a dark hole when you're looking at it here. So what I'm going to do is break it up again into some shapes. Maybe I'll just add a couple of other shapes and then just start coming in with some of the dark. And as soon as we do this, this makes this a focal area. And look at the placement. It's, I'm always talking about the thirds and the thirds. Here it is, right where I want it, right here in this focal area. So what I can do now is I can spend a lot more time actually developing this area with the most interesting things. Maybe a little pile of logs or some more bricks. And then eventually, I'm going to pull your eye down into what's going to become the foreground. And what I want to do then is I, I don't want to have a straight line. I don't want anything to become a parallel line in my foreground. And you'll notice even in this photograph how lovely I've got this dark shape leading us in. So I probably would start down here with some of these shapes. And, and then I'm just going to move my way up here and zigzag. You hear me say that a lot. I'm going to zigzag over here. Then I'm going to create a little darker shape in here. Just go really fast. This is fun. Drop it down a little more. Go up, go down, go up. Give it some variety. And then I'm going to connect it to this. Continue to go darker, darker. And then I'm going to lead your eye up here, maybe develop some more darks up in here. 
and maybe a nice dark shape in here. And of course, with these old abandoned buildings, which is one of my favorite things to do, you've always got the grass. The grass is fantastic. So look at that. We've pretty much touched all the edges of our paper and over here. What we need now is some kind of a tree shape. We have quite a few to pick from. One of the worst things I could possibly do would be to put that tree right in the middle. I wouldn't think of it. So you've heard me talk about the thirds. So coming in a third of the way over would be perfect. So I could put a high tree here, or I could put a high tree over here. I think what I'm gonna do is put the highest tree right over here. So I'm just going to come in and grow a tree. This is pretty exciting. And this tree is going to have branches, and tor and, but there's going to be foliage on it too. So see, I have to skip some lines. I often see people draw these hard, hard lines, and that's going to be a tree. But you know what I do? I draw it with broken shapes. It's a lot more interesting. Stop and start and go up. Because in between, you're going to have some foliage. And that's what, that's really important. You wanna you wanna have that broken with shapes of foliage, and the top branches usually reach up. And don't just draw the line of foliage. I see this a lot. Just drawing an outside line of foliage. Eh. Much better to draw the basic tree. Now, for example, the branches here go out about halfway. And then over here, there might be a branch close to that, starting to come up a little bit. And then the branches down here frequently just, they actually go down. So don't make all your branches the same. Try to have, try to have some longer, some going in an upward motion, some going kind of straight. And then you could just go ahead and fill in with what could be foliage. And this is going to stay a drawing. I might decide to add a little bit of tonal wash to it. But I'm basically just thinking about the drawing right now. I think I'll come in with a little more foliage up here close to the building. In fact, I think I'll have another tree interlocking with this. So again, we're going to go here, interlocking, start, stop, Start, stop, it's a few branches. And see, these branches could get to know each other. Come on over and interlock with this one. Yeah, yeah, we, oh, they like each other. This is fun. And then maybe we need one branch that's really going to take us out here. Because we, again, we don't want to have a lollipop. So we want to be sure that we're designing this so it's, Interesting. Character. It's got character. So we'll do more detail on the tree later, but you can see now we have the placement of the tree. We might want to add another tree down in this area. And I think I'll, I'll move it over a little closer here. I like that idea. So we'll just do another a smaller, shorter tree here. Let's give it a friend. Another little friend, a little taller. Stop, start, have those lines come out, break it up, and again, come in with your foliage. No outlining, just put a little bit of foliage, enough to suggest that it's a tree and it's still got some leaves on it. Now the rest of it is to come in and just give us some nice, believable shapes. I'm gonna move in even a little closer here now. You can see the side of this wall. The reality of the side of that wall is it's all bricks. It's all texture. That would be boring to do that. So what I want to do is I want to suggest to you that you consider, let's give, it's, let's give it the doorway. Again, don't make those shapes. Don't draw a straight line. Don't even think about it. Just take and do some little open, broken shapes here. Bring it down. Let's see, how can we break up the bottom of this a little bit? A 
And then we've got something overhead to define that. And then the light is touching it. You can see the thickness of the wall. Ooh, I like that. So now we've got the thickness of the wall here. And then I do want to go dark in here. So I'm just going to put some darks in it right now. Oh yeah, it already feels great. Now you can see the thickness of the wall there. And what I do when I have a whole pile of bricks like this, I'll start up here next to the structure, and I'll start building brick by brick, brick by brick. It's really kind of fun. In fact, I have a friend who has put every single brick. She practically rebuilds the whole thing. I love it. But what I like to do is then stop at some point, just pull the line out, and pretend I'm just doing the mortar. So I'm doing now little pieces of the mortar, kind of a negative, dots and dashes. And then what I'll do is I'll start, oh, I'll start building some more bricks again. And as I move across, I'll connect these bricks to the door. Look at that. And maybe I'll go back, zigzag a little bit, come in, connect it to the door again. And then I cross over, build some more bricks, and come over here and connect it to the edge of this building. And see, this is really important. I can now get by with this whole wall being done. All we have to do is think about how we're going to lead the viewer in here. Build some more dark shapes. Oh man, this is fun. Once I start drawing, I'm in another world. I just am so happy to be here. I hope you experience the same euphoria. It's To me, there's nothing more fun than drawing. Especially, I would I think, like sitting here would be great. Not if there's a lot of bugs or not if it's raining. <laughs> but generally, this is in Spain. I, I always have great weather when I go to Spain. And then there, I don't know, there was a, some kind of um, old foundation here on the, in front. So I thought that was kind of cool. I, it gave me a little more added structural lines in the thickness of the foundation. But notice I'm not drawing solid lines, am I? No. And then this foundation sort of came across here. And there was the other side of it. Uh, someday I'm going to take Jonas, who's doing my filming. I'm going to have to take him with me to Spain so we could actually be out on site right now. I think that would be cool. <laughs> I'd be happy. Okay, now we got the thickness again. And then what I would do here is just simply show how the grasses, where's, here's the bottom of that. So we've got those grasses at the base. We've got the grasses coming in here that can connect to these grasses. I'm always thinking about movement coming up, connecting, connecting. Here we can start some grass coming up from the other side of this foundation. Kind of looks like that. Then we've got the other side of the foundation here. We can put some darks in. And we can build a little more grass here. So that's kind of fun. I kind of like how that's working out. It's giving us a lead into the picture. So I love to do this. I love to start at about a third, zig in, go off the picture, zig back, go off the picture, and then go up and off the picture. So we're actually pretty close on this. I could spend some time now with some additional drawing. The two things I want to make a point of are don't ever draw a perfectly straight line. You could do it with your pencil, but when you come back with your pen, Start and stop, start and stop, leave a gap. So, and 
with your bricks, think about how you can connect that movement to doorways to the edge of the building without giving us too much detail. In fact, I have a whole lesson titled, Less is More. It has to do with making a statement without having too much in it. I think it would be great. I notice I have to have a little connection here. I need to come across, these are some boards. So some parts of this are, are actually the stonework and other parts are actually boards. Now I really haven't gotten, gotten into a lot of perspective on this. This is pretty much straight on. Although we do have a corner, it's two-point perspective. And you can see here, this is the corner, the important corner. And then these shapes, this is straight at us here. And then these shapes here are converging down. And these shapes here are starting to converge up. So our horizon line is right in here. I always identify that first. Do my major shapes and then Mostly what I wanted to do is just share with you how much fun you can have with a pen. And then I mentioned this idea I got from my friend Bonnie, where you can come in and anywhere you want, you can just give some nice gray tones. See, like it would be fun just to put some gray tones in here. Just scratchy little shapes of gray without getting those hard, hard lines. So I'm going to go off camera now, and I'm going to have some fun finishing this, putting in some more details, probably growing a few more trees up here. And then I've got to, I'm going to finish the lesson by sharing with you some beautiful triads of primary colors that you can use to do a finished look. For example, here's one that I did in South Africa, and this was so much fun. These were these houses were looked like houses that you know they had actual thatched roofs and uh, oh they were so perfect it was a little fishing village and the lady had her laundry out and interlocked with the doorway it was piles of stuff and rubble everywhere oh it was so fun and all I did was put this little wash with these old world colors over it and this is a finished painting. So when I come back, I'm going to share with you these triads of color. Well, I'm excited to introduce to you two primary triads of color that I use a lot. I'm going to use it in this lesson, and you're going to see me use it in future lessons too. And what it depends on is the triad of primary colors. This particular triad here, I refer to this as the Nita Angle Palette. She was the first one to introduce it to me. And it's extreme primaries. So you can make up your own, but the first color you want is a, the most primary color on your palette. And see, I have two. I have Areolan Yellow and Windsor Yellow. And then you want a primary red. And see, I have Quinacridone Coral as my primary red, but you could also use Permanent Rose, you can see that's a little pinkier, it's got a little more blue in it. And then there's a new color, it's been around for a while, but it's relatively new, and that is Quinacridone Red, and that's that would work too. So one of these reds, I do not recommend Alizarin Crimson because it is staining, and we don't want to use staining colors in this. And then for the primary triad, Cobalt Blue. I'm telling you, cobalt is the perfect blue. There's no red in it, there's no yellow in it. So just using this combination and the yellow, combining it here, you get all the colors that are in your palette. But what we're going to do today is we're just going to use this primary triad to do an underpainting. I have a second primary triad that I use a lot too. Actually, this is my favorite. This one here is called the Old World Palette. And I also call it the Halifax, Halifax Palette because when I went to teach in Halifax, this were, these were the favorite colors of the ladies out there and their paintings were so beautiful. 
And I didn't have indigo on my palette at the time, and I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? I, I really love the results, so I just said, okay, do it. Bite the bullet and do it. So when I do this Halifax palette, what I do is I set up another primary, but they're not bright. They're much less intense. So for example, I switch over here. I use quinacridone gold. And you can also use raw sienna. That's a much uh, lighter color, but it's really pretty. It's transparent. I also use quinacridone burnt orange. And that's my red. So it's really an orange, but I use that as my red. And then for my blue, I use indigo. Now indigo is a color that has white in it, has black in it. We're not sure what's in it. Slightly um, opaque. That's why I had it off my palette. But thanks to those Halifax ladies, it's back on. So now here's the deal. When you take this color, mix it, and then this color and mix it, and then this color and mix it, oh, it's, they're, they're just beautiful. It's a perfect tone to put under your paintings. So I'm gonna show you how to do it. I'm gonna show you a few examples of, of paintings that I've done. I call these a painting because it's got color on it, but it's probably more of a drawing. But I, I, whenever I go out, when I'm teaching on location, I take with me my portfolio. And in my portfolio, ah, let's see what's here. I have a number of pieces, like I might decide to draw some people that day. So I just keep sketching till this is full and then I take another one with me. And I take along pictures that are partly finished. This is, I just got back from Venice. And this is, um, these are some paintings that aren't completed yet, but I've done the drawing. Um, oh, here's one of my favorite places in Venice. You can see the pillars and, uh, boy, this says Venice. This is, this is about a block and a half from the hotel I stayed at. Here's when I started and got interrupted. But see, these will all get finished someday. And I just carry these pictures with me. And even on location, when I'm going to a location to paint, I take these with me. Because if I'm not inspired by anything, I get out the paintings that are partly done and work on those. Then, of course, I always bring a couple of on pure white papers. And then, best of all, I take with me these lovely underpaintings. And sometimes I just start my drawing right on top of this underpainting. So these are some examples of some pieces that I have done where I went out on location, took a look at the subject, and I went, oh my gosh, this would be perfect with the old world or the Halifax underpainting. So then I just pull it out of my uh, portfolio and set it up, and away I go. And this was one, you saw this earlier, this was one I did in Anniston, South Africa. And this was actually done with the, the brown pen. So I had to dig one out here. They don't make this anymore. I really love the sepia tone, especially with these subdued colors. But you can see I had a lot of fun and pretty soon when I came in and started putting in all these beautiful darks in the background, I decided I don't need to do anymore. Sign the painting, it's a done deal. Here's one, another one I put on top of an underpainting. Some of you might recognize this. This is Tom's Burn Down Cafe or Tom's Burn Down Palace. What does he call it? Anyway, it's on Madeline Island. It's, it, if you go to Madeline Island, you have to go here. It's a fantastic place. And uh, you can see he's selling t-shirts. He's got sculptures all over, plants. It's just a clutter of stuff. And it's under an old circus tent. And then behind the t-shirts here is a bar and pizzas. In fact, he was one of my foster sons. And so we, we never miss an opportunity to go see Tom at his burned down place. And it, again, it's a fabulous subject. So now all I have to do is come in and paint over it. See, it gives kind of a circusy look to it to start with. And now all I have to do is come in and put some paint right on top of these colors, ready to go. Here's one. 
I pulled out this toned paper sitting while I was having lunch in Siena. And I looked up and here were all these gorgeous rooftops and chimneys and laundry and everything that I love to draw. So I went ahead and drew, drew it in with my brown pen. And then I decided to come in and using variations of those same colors, I came in here and put in the shadows. So I just took some of the indigo, mixed it with a little of the burnt, uh, burnt orange, and it gave me these grayed down tones. And those are the tones that I used to put to make uh, the cast shadows. And see, this is done. I don't plan to do much. In, it's, you can see I haven't finished it yet, and I'm I might put a little color on the laundry just to do one little touch. Here's a painting I did in Malaga, Spain. And it started out with an underpainting. And then, so a lot of the colors you see here in the background are the original underpainted colors. You can see the nice soft tonal changes there. And so I drew this picture right over the top of that underpainting. And then afterwards, I just felt it needed a little more kick. So using the same colors that were in the underpainting, I just brought them a little bit darker to pop this out. And again, I just came in with a few of the cast shadows to give it some depth. So this is just a terrific way to do a painting. And uh, my purpose in this lesson is for, for you to know about taking out a toned paper when you're going out to paint. You're, I'm also going to use this underpainting idea in a flower lesson. This beautiful painting here by Wyland Lorber has a underpainting using the old world colors, saving some whites, putting in some of those tonal washes. And these flowers were protected. That's why they're the only white on the paper other than some of those in the background. And see those first layers here were from, with, show the underpainting. The second layer shows these mid-tones, and the third layer gives us the darks. So this is going to be a beautiful lesson on negative painting, coming up soon. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get started. With, I'm going to show you how to do an underpainting using these tonal colors. The first underpainting that I'm going to show you is the Nita Angle. And this one, this one, this one, as you recall, is the very primary one. And I mean, you can really see the difference in these two when you put them side by side. This is the old world, this is the Nita Angle. And with this one, I'm going to be using very, very primary colors. So I'm going to start with my Windsor Yellow, then I'm going to go into my Quinacridone Rose and Cobalt. And one of the things I want to try to do is to save... <laughs> one of the things I want to do is I want to save a little path of white in there. So we're going to start by wetting the back. Very important. Flip it over. Wet the front. Make sure you're on the front of the paper, there's more sizing on that side, and the colors move so much better. So I'm just using my one and a half inch flat, and I'm making sure this is really, really wet. You're going to be surprised. These colors, most of them don't move. Now the only color I'm using that does move is my Windsor Yellow. and You always want to activate it. So you grab it here, you activate it on your palette, and one of the things you want to do is you want to just sort of put it here and there in a circular form. See, I'm leaving some holes, but it's basically a circle. We're creating a focus of light. Now I'm going to take my permanent rose, activate it, always activate it. And this time I'm going to put it next to the yellow and some of it I'm pulling out to the end of the paper. But you'll notice again, I'm doing this in kind of a circular form. I might just hit a little drops around. 
The third color I'm going to do is cobalt blue. And again, I'm completing the circle. I'm saving some whites that are exiting to the edge of the paper, but I'm pretty much painting out the corners. And you can see, boy, it looks bright. Ooh, scary. Okay, now the, the most important thing to get this beautiful vibrancy and glow in the work is to let these colors blend a bit. So we're gonna start tipping. And you can see there's a few colors moving. Takes a while for them to move and glow. Doesn't happen overnight. But see, they're not really blending. I want more blending than that. So I usually give them a little chance to do their thing. This area here is working, but boy, the other isn't. And this is the most important thing. You gotta save some of those whites. We're getting some blending in here now. So I'm gonna take my sprayer and I'm just going to encourage it a little bit oh yeah now we're seeing some movement I want the red and the yellow to blend together and it's working a bit so you just keep moving these colors around and get them to move and do their thing just keep going around and round Here's another one needs a little encouragement. Come on, come on. Oh, you can see now they're really starting to move. So it's just a matter of going round and round. You'll notice now I have a bump in the paper when you see that. Set it down, lift it up, lift it up, and put it down again. And in most cases, it gets way better. Okay, now this time, I'm getting a little frustrated and I kind of lost my white spot there. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to just take and spray a white path right to the edge, right out. And you can do this. It's okay to, to spray the color and just let it run out. Give it a minute because that's a lot of extra water that you've introduced. Now we're just going to start our little roundabout here. You can see we're getting some lovely movement there. Again now, I wouldn't mind if this were to run the other way. So I'm going to now, instead of spraying, remember before I sprayed it into the circle, now I'm going to spray it out to the edge. And again, I wouldn't mind a little exit right here. I'm just going to let it go out. Oh, yeah. I actually like what's happening here. Let's pick up those drips. Very nice. Now this is going to dry approximately 20% lighter. So you can still see we have a very, ooh, really nice glow. We've got whites coming out and touching the edge of the paper. Uh, we're getting a certain amount of granulation, which I'm enjoying. And what I'm going to do now is wait for the perfect moment and I'm going to put in a little bit of salt. Now the salt, I don't usually put the salt in the dark areas. I usually put the salt as a transition from the white going back into the next area. So if you look at these, this is what the salt did. All these little lovely white spots. But see, they're down here next to the white. They're not back here. So we're just going to have to set this aside for a bit and we're going to put the salt in when it's time. See, if I put the salt in right now, it would get to be, well, it would kind of look like this. That's table salt gone wild. See, it gives you great big, great big shapes. So you don't want to do it too early. 
well, this is exciting. I'm going to try to get that same spontaneous spirit into this drawing that we started. And you'll see I did do a little homework. It's this one I did with the black pen. So I went home and I tried to get a lot of this to connect. I even added a few more trees up here, a few more leaves. But I'm really happy with the way these dark patterns and things lead us from one part to the other. This is important and we can step almost like steps. This is some old foundation in the ground. But see, you, I always think it's important to have something to lead you in. And this, this is perfect right here, just the grass. So this leads us in, then we zigzag through the picture all the way out the top. So now we're going to put that Halifax triad right on top of this drawing. So to do it, first of all, we're going to start with the background, wetting the back. And this, this step is very important. When you wet the back, then the picture lays flat. Now we missed an opportunity yesterday. I spilled an entire glass of water on top of this drawing. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And we were, we were so worried about picking up the water, we forgot to film it. And really, it's too bad because we want to, someday we want to have some bloopers. Well, that was a big one. It, it even got on my water lilies, but they're all okay. That's why I use Arches paper, folks. Arches paper, the best. Comes from France, and it doesn't make any difference. If, if it gets wet, it holds the color. So now we're ready to come in with those beautiful old world colors. It's perfect for this drawing. Now the first one I'm going to use is quinacridone gold. You can see that I'm starting to activate it. And I'm going to think now about saving, I want to save a white through this most, the, to me this is the most interesting area. So I'm going to try to save a white here. So that means I'm going to put this gold color in a circular motion but I'm going to save that white and see a lot of people make it as a circle and that's okay too but I think it gets boring I, I really like this this technique now I'm going to go into my quinacridone burnt orange activate it on my palette I'm going to put the color here next to the yellow so now I'm working my way out to the edge of the paper now we're going to come in here. I've got a little white leading in here. I like that. I've got a white leading out. I've got another little white leading here. So I'm going to try to keep those. Of course, you always have to bless the picture. That's important. You can put a little bit of blessing in there. Now the color that is most difficult is indigo. And I don't know if you can see, but when you activate indigo, let me tell you, it activates really dark, really fast. So I don't want to get too dark, so I'm just going to put that down. And I'm going to try to make each corner a little different. Maybe I won't do that corner very much. So now we're ready to start tipping. And look at some of the beautiful colors blending already. Ooh, let's just see what happens. No, it's pretty interesting to me, but all three of these colors do not move on a wet surface. Look, at, they're staying exactly where I put them. There's a little movement right here. So I just slowly go round and round. Get all the way off the edge there. Here we go. There's a little movement over here. So I never start spraying right away. I give the colors a little time to get to know each other. They're having a party right now. They're having a good time. Ooh, I like it. I almost like it without any spraying. I might, I may have been a lucky girl. Let's see. You can see the light leading us into our focal area, leading us in over here, coming out or in over here. I actually like this just the way it is. <laughs> well, sometimes a kid gets lucky. So 
all I can say. <laughs> and isn't this just great to produce all this vibrancy and glow and set the stage for this lovely subject with three simple triads of color? I really like it. Actually, I'm not going to spray anything. <laughs> I think it worked out great. Just look at that beautiful transition going from the white into the yellow, into the orange, into the blue. Well, thank you, ladies in Halifax. I would never be working with this combination if it weren't for you. Well, I think we're at the stage where we're going to just let this set here. And we're going to just let the colors dry. They're going to dry approximately 20% lighter. And at the proper time, I'm going to put the salt in. I'm going to do a little check here on this one. Oh, this is the perfect time for salt. It's, I'm going to use just table salt. And it's, you're going to see I've got just a little bit on my fingers, not very much at all. And I'm just going to go basically next to my whites. That's it. One little trail with the salt. And you can see it was the perfect time to salt. I guess I got it a little more than I thought, but I'm going to like whatever I get. So we'll give that a minute and we'll show you what happens. And then we're going to salt this in a few minutes. And that's it. So I hope you, I hope you like this lesson and I hope, I hope you consider trying it sometime. The toned paper. Thanks. It's been a few minutes. And I've been checking this very carefully. And you can see now the glisten has gone off the surface. You don't want to put this in too soon. It's very important. Just the glisten is left. And so again, I'm just going to put a little texture next to my whites. And going out the edge, just a little bit more in here. So it's going to put most of the texture on my little building. I think it's going to work out quite well. Here's an example now of what happened to our other underpainting. You can see I do have a few bursts. And too bad, you just have to like it. But for the most part, I've got some very nice little textural transitions where they're just lovely little going from the white dot, dot, dot into the next area. And I've kept these areas fairly clean. I'm actually quite pleased with this. Okay, now you remember that this is a way to tone your paper so you don't have that intimidation of working on a white paper. So you can either tone it before you go out to paint and then put your drawing right on that toned paper or as you saw me in this lesson, I did the toning afterwards. I drew it first and then did the toning. Now at this stage, if I want to, I could still come in and do some cast shadows. I could do some green trees. I could do some colors in the foliage. But I kind of like it just the way it is. I think it's a very nice statement. And I just wanted to point out that the last thing I did was put a little salt that, again, is just a little textural effect going from the white that I left into the tonal areas right next door. So you'll notice all my whites have little dots coming out. I love that. And the dots right here on the main. So my lightest light is in the focal area. I hoped for that. And then the, the transitional areas have the little dots moving out. So I'm very pleased. In, in the darkest, grayest colors are the furthest away from my subject. So this focus of light is very dramatic. It really, uh, I think it really does a great job for, for a nice presentation. I hope you enjoy it.